So thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, yep. So I'll talk about how uh, you can use um, Merlin to scale up your Neman deployments um, to both more traditional um, infrastructures, but also to uh, Kubernetes. Um, so just a very quick uh, agenda, what to expect. Basically, I'm going to do a, an introduction of uh, Merlin in general, um, and then I'll do a small demo of that. And then we'll have a look at the Merlin container puller, which is then what allows us to scale uh, our Neman deployment into a Kubernetes cluster. And I'll do a demo of that as well. Um, so just a very quick slide about me. Um, so I started working at a company called OP5 in around the, in the beginning of 2018. Um, these days we're called I2S Group. Um, and basically since uh, I started, uh, I've been part of maintaining Neman. Um, and I've also uh, obviously worked quite a lot on Merlin, which we'll talk about today. Um, so enough about that, let's get started with Merlin. So Merlin, what it stands for, it stands for Module for Effortless Redundancy and Load Balancing in Neiman. Um, when it started out, the last one was Nagios, um, but these days we only support uh, Neiman, which is then a fork of Nagios. Um, so a little bit of, of history of Merlin. So it's quite an old project. It started around, I think it was the end of 2005, maybe start of 2006, so way before my time. Um, but the idea was that uh, there was a need to handle sending report data and status information from Nagios into um, a database. Um, and at that time, there was, I think, a tool called NDO Utils. Um, uh, what the the guys at OP5 didn't really like that it was seemed to have several shortcomings, and um, so they started from scratch, uh, and the idea was to um, build or to send <coughs> uh, Neiman events into a different uh, daemon or Nagios events as it was at that time, of course, into a daemon, and then the daemon would. Um, do the rights to the database because you didn't want to do kind of those expensive operations in the core. Um, now, <coughs> someone got the idea to try this over a network, so to have multiple uh, Neiman instances and send events back and forth towards those instances using the same data protocol. And actually, that ended up working quite well. And then Merlin was kind of built out to handle this kind of scaling stuff. Um, so, so these days, what Merlin does is that it provides a way to cluster and load balance your Neiman instance, and you can also uh, have redundancy. Um, <coughs> these days, we can still write state changes to database, but we are not writing all the status information. So, um, and perf data as well. We don't uh, store that stuff in the database. So, there are a bunch of other tools you can use for that. For example, live status. Um, or LMD that we recommend that you use instead. Um, so this is quite an old project, but I wanted just to bring up some of the news that we've done recently. Um, so these days we are building packages for uh, CentOS 7 and 8 at this time, and we're using OpenSUSE build service to do that, and that provides you a uh, packages that you can install using your uh, the operating system package manager. Uh, so it's really quite easy to get started and update updating uh, Merlin as well. Done loads of uh, documentation improvements. Um, and also over the years, what has happened was that some kind of vendor specific stuff kind of creeped into Merlin, which was unfortunate, but now we've spent a lot of time trying to get those things out of, out of Merlin again making it uh, much more generic and able to be used uh, outside of OP5. Um, we have some new features, kind of. We have, uh, in the past, for a very long time, you had to uh, identify different nodes only with an IP address, but that caused some problems if you had like an NIT or something um, between your nodes. So now you can use like a UUID instead. We have encrypted connection connectivity, and then we have that now the um, container puller, which then allows us to um, deploy Merlin into Kubernetes. 
Um, so a little bit about the sort of architecture of Merlin. Um, we have the Merlin uh, event broker module, which is where most of the stuff really is. Um, basically what it does is that it handles the uh, event broker callbacks from Neiman and send uh, a bunch of events from uh, Neiman onto uh, remote nodes and also the Merlin daemon. And um, the daemon then is what allows you to um, save state changes to a database and usually you would use that for uh, reporting, uh, historical reporting information so you can build like SLA reports, stuff like that. Um, we have the database, which is uh, it's a MySQL one. Um, you could probably make it work with other databases as well, but MySQL is the recommended one. Um, and then we have a bunch of um, utility scripts, basically, that makes it life a little bit easier for you when you're working with Merlin. Um, we call those the Mon scripts. Um, and we'll see a bunch of those in the demo later. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of uh, breathing, huh? Can you hear me still? Okay, good. How about now? Okay, so um, a bit about the, a bit more about the architecture. So this here is a, like a single node system. Um, can you see the cursor? Oh, here it is. Uh, so basically, we have Neiman, of course. Uh, Neiman loads um, its configuration in from file. Um, we have the Merlin module then, and we have Merlin also has some basic configuration um, file there that we use. And we then have a Unix socket that we use to connect to the Merlin daemon, and we use um, a library called libdbi, which is kind of an old C library for writing stuff into databases. And this should support multiple um, database formats, but uh, well, I only tried MySQL, but it might work with others. And we use that then to, to store stuff into a database. Then we have something called a binary lock, or bin lock for short. And the idea behind this is that in case the, the daemon dies, then uh, we write stuff, all the events that should have been written to the daemon, uh, we write to this lock, uh, which is either in memory or on disk, depending on the situation. Um, and then Whenever the, the daemon comes up again, we can drop all of those events back into the daemon so we don't lose any data. Um, now, if you have um, a multi-node system, which is usually what Merlin is used for, um, we have to, um, basically the same co all of the same components over here on the right side. And we have two connection points. Um, so one of them is a TCP connection, and that's the one where we we used to send all of our um, all the Neiman events, and we'll have a look at exactly the events we're sending in a second. And then we have an SSH connection between the nodes, and the SSH connection you use to keep the Neiman config on separate nodes in sync, so that they have um, the required uh, object configuration needed. Um, and the connection between these two nodes, <coughs> in case it should go down. We're also using the bin lock to save any events. So if one of the nodes should disappear for some reason, um, we'll save all of the events that should have been sent to that. And we'll, as soon as the node comes back online, um, we'll, we'll be able to resend all of those events. So we shouldn't lose any history, basically. Um, so we have some uh, Merlin uh, description of some of the Merlin packets that we're sending. Um, so this is done over TCP, and this is the default port. Um, and you can encrypt that optionally with um, this stream cipher called XSALSA20. Um, we use a library called Ipsodium to do that. And, and um, well, it's kind of an unusual encryption algorithm, but uh, in the end it was the one that was uh, easiest to implement in Merlin and uh, the way that it looked these days. Um, so the kind of the packet types we, we have. So we have some control packets, and those are 
uh, special Merlin package that we use to uh, so that Merlin can keep track of the state of the cluster. Um, it includes stuff like the configuration hash. Um, it includes stuff like um, what does the node think of the cluster look like at this point in time. And we can use that to make some choices on whether um, the nodes or the cluster are in a healthy state. Uh, and then we're sending a bunch of Neiman events. Um, these are basically uh, internal Neiman data structures that we wrap. Um, and the, it's things like check results, it's like external commands, um, comments and downtimes, notifications, um, all the things that you you, you want to, uh, that you need to make sure that um, two nodes have the same view of the monitored world. Um, yeah. So, um, a bit about how we sync configuration. So, basically what Merlin does is that it keeps tracks of how we think uh, the remote nodes um, configuration should look like. And in case we f find out that there is something which doesn't match, um, we'll trigger a resync of configuration. And that happens to then over SSH. And when we do that, we also restart the remote node because the expectation is that we're going to need to reload the Merlin or the Neiman uh, object configuration. Um, let's see. So, clustering, right? So, a single Merlin node can have um, X amount of neighbors. Um, I think it's something like 85,000, much, much more than you need. Um, and there are kind of three types of neighbors that you can have. Um, and this is kind of the relationship between two nodes. So they can be peers, poles, and masters, and we'll have a, have a look at, at that. So we'll start off with peers. Um, so you can set up any number of peers for load balancing or redundancy. And these peers share the monitoring load equally. Um, or I should say they divide the uh, service and host objects um, equally. Um, so it might be that you have some objects that are checked much more frequently than others, uh, but we don't really look at that. We only look at the amount of, of total host and services. Um, and the idea is that if any of these uh, nodes then go down, um, the other nodes will take over the load completely. Um, and that allows us to uh, have quite a resilient system. Um, what else? Um, and peers, they, sh they should ideally be quite close to each other on the network, so they should at least be sort of in the same network or data center. Um, ideally, they should be, be behind the same switch um, if possible, but that might not always be, be possible. Um, so between these nodes, what we are sharing is uh, we're sharing both config and we're sharing check results. So if we go into one of the masters and change the, the object configuration, that should trickle down to the two other nodes and they should restart and reload the configuration. So all of these nodes will have the complete uh, Neiman object configuration. Um, and the way it works is that Neiman actually thinks that it's monitoring all of those objects, but Merlin will, whenever there is a time to schedule a check, Merlin will intervene and check, hey, there's actually another node that is responsible for, for executing this check. And the other nodes should then send the check results um, back between all of the nodes, so they should have always the same view of the world. Um, Another thing when you're building the cluster is to think a little bit about how many nodes you want and how many nodes that you think it's acceptable to lose. Um, so if you have if, well, if we have three nodes and as in this example, if they are running at full capacity, obviously if one of them goes down, the two other nodes are going to try to take over that monitoring load. But if they are already at full capacity, obviously they are going to be completely overloaded. Um, so you, you have to think a little bit about um, how much load you put on the systems compared to how many nodes that you think it's acceptable to lose in your cluster. Um, so the other types of nodes we have are kind of pullers. 
Um, Polos are responsible for checking only a specific host group or a set of host groups. Um, and Polos, you can um, you can peer those as well, so you can have multiple nodes then responsible for a specific set of host groups. Uh, you can peer those as, as much as you want. Um, Configuration changes should never happen down on a polar level. You should always ensure that configuration changes are done from a master, and the master will ensure that the correct configuration is sent down to the polars. So the polar will have a subset of your full configuration, um, and it will never know of, the, of any of the objects or the checks that are outside of this host group. Um, the configuration that we are sending from the masters include all of the information that you you're going to need. It includes the sort of the basic object definitions, uh, but also things like time zones or uh, time periods, it is, um, contacts, and all that stuff that you're going to need for for your Neumann objects. Uh, so that you never the polls will never receive any events or check results from the masters coming down. Um, and usually the use case for this is if you have sort of your main data center and you have a couple of more remote sites. Um, there's a couple of things uh, that makes pullers kind of make sense. The one is that probably you're not gonna, it might be that you can't actually access the, the objects that you want to monitor because they're from the masters because they're in a separate, uh, completely separate network and you don't want to open up all those uh, the connectivity from your servers from outside that network. Uh, the other thing is that uh, it's probably nice to have your monitoring engine quite close to where you, the things that you monitor are. Um, now we can have multiple groups then of polars, um, and these groups are always completely separate, so they will never talk to each other um, if they are monitoring different host groups. Um, um, uh, so yeah, so if you're monitoring some objects here and some objects over here, you should never uh, see <coughs> uh, the stuff or the the poles that are set up over here will not know of any objects that are exist over here. So they are kind of a little bit isolated from each other. Um, now, if um, all pullers in a peer group goes down. By default, um, the masters will try to, or will attempt to um, execute the checks that should have been executed here. Um, but you can disable that, and that's probably the most more common case because it's quite often the the masters are actually not able to to do the monitoring. Um, in that case, what happens is that the checks will just not be run um, until we have uh, some some. Uh, servers up here running again. Um, in case the connection goes down between, if they're actually online but the connection is broken, um, it's a quite common case as well, then we use the bin lock to save all of the check results that we did in the pool in the meantime and when the connection is re-established uh, we should see the results being pushed back up um, to the master. So if there's um, <coughs> like issues with network connectivity um, we shouldn't lose any events at all. It'll, it'll, it'll come um, later when we are able to send the results. Um, yeah, so in this case, just so <coughs> that it's clear, what we have here is that we have three masters, and these masters are peers to each other, right? We have <coughs> two poles here. These poles have three masters each and one peer each. Uh, and the masters up here, they have I said they have uh, three peers, and and then they have uh, four poles in total, um, in which are made up in two groups. Um, so a little more about the kind of different connectivity options that we 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 allow. Um, so by default, um, we call it an active polar. and in this case, basically either node establish this TCP connection and the masters always kind of pushes configuration from the master down to the polars. And we also have something called limited active, which is basically when the polar cannot reach the master. 
um, in this case we always establish the TCP connection from the master. Um, and then we have a passive puller, and this is the case where the master actually can't reach the puller. Um, and in this case, the puller will establish the TCP connection, and rather than the master pushing configuration, the puller will know um, that it can log in with SSH into the master and fetch the object configuration as needed. So this allows us really to um, use Merlin in quite a wide variety of uh, network connection or network situations um, and depending on what you want you can uh, for example disallow SSH access from the one of the directions depending on what makes sense in your situation if that's what you want. Um, then quickly on the report database um, so we are storing in that only state changes so only if there's actually a state of change we are, we are doing any writes to the database um, and we are writing also flapping events and downtime events. So that should be enough um, for you to um, calculate like SLA reports, uh, things like that. Um, there isn't actually any nice software that does this for you. Uh, so you're a little bit on your own if you want to use that functionality at this point. Um, and also we assume we have a non-clustered database. Um, so as we saw on the architectural diagram, um, each sort of running Merlin instance had its own database and it's writing every single event into that report database. Um, and this is also kind of why it's important for peers to be close to each other, especially if you care about this stuff, uh, because you might come into a situation where the connectivity between two peers are down and then um, they might have a different idea of what happened in the past, uh, especially if they are like very far from each other. So <coughs> ideally, peers should be close to each other, pullers can be far from each other. Um, so that was it from the slides for the first run. So I'll try to do uh, a bit of a demo. So is this text good enough? I think, is it okay? Can you read it? Or should it be a bit bigger? Um, good. <laughs> um, well, shout if it's not big enough. Um, so I've done a little bit of uh, preparation here. So um, I have a couple of uh, Linux container running uh, on my local laptop here. Um, and um, what I've done is that I've installed Neiman and Merlin on these. And I've also... Um, Synced SSH keys between those so we can do passwordless SSH authentication between them. Um, and now, what I'm going to start with is I'm going to have two masters and I'm going to um, pair them so that we have a small cluster here. Um, also, I have added on one of the masters, master one, I've added a little bit of, um, I've added a little bit of um, configuration here. Um, basically just a bunch of dummy hosts and uh, nothing too interesting. Uh, and also, just as you know, you can use Frock if you want to do that for your interface on your on your masters, also on your pullers if you want to do that. Um, so that works fine. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a M1 command to uh, peer these masters up. Um, so what we need to do is we're going to use mon node, node add, and we are going to call it master2. The type of this neighbor is that it's a master, um, and we're going to grab its address as well. Um, its IP address is this one. Um, actually, you don't always have to use the put in an address manually. Um, in case this one, this master two, actually resolves to a DNS name, you don't need to do that. Uh, the only thing is we don't support IPv6 at this point, so Linux might try to use the IPv6 address and then it kind of goes haywire. So better to put in the IP. Um, and then I'm going to have to do the same thing uh, on the master2 just in the opposite direction. Um, so I'm going to add master1 as a master. Ugh. And I'm going to need to grab the IP of master1 as well. Um, so 
So now we added this node, master1, on master2, and we added master2 on master1. And I'm then going to do a restart. This restarts uh, Neiman as well as Merlin. Uh, it's just a, a quick sort of convenience function. Oh, that's not good. Ah, demos. So what did I do? <sighs> Very fine. Okay, not sure what that's doing there. Let's try again. No. Hmm. What did I do? Why does that keep popping up? But it's not there. Okay. Fine. Um, good. Okay, nice. So now we can see on this side we can use this mon command, uh, mon node status. Uh, and it will tell you the status of the cluster. And it will tell you now that master2 is inactive. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for this. The main one is that master2 hasn't been restarted. So master2, while well, we added the master on, on this side, and we didn't restart it. So if we have a look at at the mon node status over here, we can see we only have the lo kind of local node. Um, so, in this case, what we want to do is we want to make sure that the config from master one is actually pushed to master two, uh, because we have a bunch of config added on master one and master two is kind of clear. So, for the very first con config sync, we are going to do it manually, um, and we do this. Um, we always do it from the Neiman user, and there's a command called mon oconf push. And we specify the name of the master, and this will push then the relevant configuration to master2, and it will also restart it. Um, oh man. And this node, of course, also is kind of not working as it should. Interestingly. Why does it keep adding that one? That is strange. Seems like... Ah! Hmm, this is weird. It seems like they think they are polar some, for some reason. how it goes with them also. Aye, aye, aye. Okay. I wonder why that is broken. Um. Was this else here as well? No? That's unfortunate. Not really sure why. Okay, I'm gonna give up, I think. And um, this should have worked, and they should have been peered, and we should see nice uh, green things happening. 
Um, for some reason, that doesn't work. Um, I'm going to try to add a polar instead then. Um, hopefully, that will work better. Um, so I'm going to uh, remove master2. I'm on node remove master02. And restart. Hopefully, that will work. OK, that worked at least. That's good. So I'm going to try to add the polar instead. Uh, hopefully that works better with the other master kind of broken. Um, so for polars, what we have to do is we have to um, specify the host group that we want the polar to be responsible for. Um, I think I have one called polar group. And again, we have to grab the address um, of the... Oh. And we grab the address of the polar. Ugh. Okay, forgot an add. One node add polar zero one type equal polar. Um, so let's see if we can still restart. Okay, that's good. So when we restart and we have added a polar, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sp Merlin is gonna split the object configuration and make prepare like a spe specific configuration for the polar to uh, to grab. Um, and on the polar side, we're gonna have to add um, on node add. We're gonna have to add the master then. Oops. And we ah, need the address of the master. And then hopefully we can um, push the configuration this time, and it should work. Um, and it's the similar function. We use mono can push polar zero one, and it should. That looked better. Uh, no. <sighs> okay. Well, this is going great, huh? No, that's not the right address. Oh. So it's complaining that um, the host group I specified doesn't exist for some reason. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay, and we can't do that because Neiman is down. <laughs> That's strange. That should work. That is just strange. So how about now? Okay. Huh? So I think something happened with the object configuration here for some reason. Does it not load in the conf D? Hmm. 
well, seems like I've messed up this system completely. I'm not sure why it's behaving like that. That is strange. Okay, I think I'm gonna give up. That's unfortunate. I hope to be able to give you a demo. It's also gonna kind of break the next step, which is a shame. Um, ah, well, that's the nature of live demos, it seems. Um, so that I'm just gonna go through the slides of the container puller. Um, so basically what the container puller does is that it allows you to run Neiman and Merlin um, inside containers. Um, and the main target really is uh, to run it in Kubernetes. Um, should also work in Docker Compose, but um, really the main thing is Kubernetes because it allows you to be able to sort of use the auto scaling functionality that Kubernetes have to scale up um, your polos kind of dynamically. Um, we do have two containers. Uh, we have the Neiman containers that contains the Neiman as, as well as the Merlin module. Uh, and we have another container with the Merlin daemon. Uh, and the Merlin daemon usually doesn't do anything, really, because in this case we are not going to really bother setting up um, a database from that side. Um, <clears throat> but we kind of need it for historical reasons. Um, and this whole thing is configured with uh, environment variables and um, when you do the Kubernetes deployment files, which is kind of cool. So you shouldn't need to be able to do all this one node add stuff that we did here. It should kind of happen automatically. Um, so how it works is that when the container start up, we connect to something called the designated master. So you have to choose one of your masters and connect to that one. Um, And what it'll do, it'll go in and it, it'll pass the current configuration of the of the cluster, and then it will sort of automatically add itself to that cluster. And we're also syncing the encryption key so that we have encrypted commu encrypted communication, and um, we're gonna restart everything, so we should have a, a healthy cluster in the end. Um, and then we have something called the cluster updates. Um, um, so basically it's a, <clears throat> with these Merlin control packets, basically a, a master can detect if a puller has an incorrect cost cluster configuration. Um, and then we notify the puller of that. And then the puller will go back into the master and basically re-parse the cluster configuration and update itself so that everything should be, so all the nodes in the cluster should have the say, same view of how the cluster looks. Um, and then I was going to do a demo of that. Um, might be difficult, um, <laughs> given that these systems are kind of borked. Um, that's a shame. Um, what we can look at is um, deployments files. So when you set up the container pool, there's a couple of things that you need to do. Um, the first thing is you're probably going to want to build your own uh, container image. Um, inside that, um, you should probably install some plugins because we don't ship any by default. Um, and also, um, you should ensure that you have some SSH keys installed so that we can connect to the masters. Um, you can also use Kubernetes secrets if you, if you prefer. Um, to do that rather than shipping the, the SSH keys inside the container image. Um, and then we can have a little look on the um, the Kubernetes deployment file. Um, so there's a bunch of sort of standard setup stuff at the top. But the interesting bits is really these environment well variables down here. Um, so what we have is we specify the IP address of the master, the designated master then. Uh, we give it a name, uh, we specify the port, and then we give uh, the puller itself 
an address and we grab uh, the pod IP from Kubernetes. Um, and the master is not going to use that for anything really. Um, however, the pullers, if we're scaling up to multiple replicas inside Kubernetes, they will use that one uh, to connect to each other. And we also give the puller a name when it registers with the masters. Uh, we grab that as well from Kubernetes. And then we have um, the host groups that the puller should uh, be responsible for. Um, you can also, with Merlin, you can also actually sync files because we already have um, the ability to sync configuration files. You can sync arbitrary files as well. Um, can be used to sync stuff like plugins that doesn't really have any dependencies. Um, um, could also use to, um, so with the newest version of Merlin, you can have, um, you can load like credentials from a secret vault. So perhaps you wa are going to want to sync that one. Uh, to the different nodes. So uh, if we specify this, this polar is going to connect to the master and grab the files that are this path, basically. Um, and then you should have been able to do uh, this. Uh, but this is not going to work, given that the master is not really in a healthy state, um, which is kind of a shame. Um, I kind of wish that I could show you this um, <coughs> because it's really uh, kind of neat um, so because when you spin it up you'll get one single pot and one polar but what you can do is actually use this command to scale up the amount of replicas you have so you could set it to like four or three or five or whatever and it will scale up uh, to that amount of polars. Um, you can also use um, Kubernetes horizontal pot autoscaler and that allows you to set um, like resource limitations. So, for example, you can set set it to scale up to another node when each pod then uses a specific amount of resources, and then it will sort of automatically scale as your monitoring workload increases, and it will scale down again in case the the monitoring load um, decreases, um, and it should automatically then register to um, to the clusters. Um, um, but I can't really show you that, given I don't really have any healthy systems up and running, um, which is kind of a shame. Um, uh, uh, well, I think I'm not going to bother trying to make this work, because it seems it's not really wanting to do that. Um, it's weird. Yeah, I'm not really sure what happened. I test I swear I tested this multiple times <laughs> before. Um and of course it has to break the one time that matters. Um well. So that's a shame. Um but that was basically what I had to show you. Um, um Yeah, I'm sorry that it didn't really work out the way I hoped, but that's how it goes. Um we have some documentation, uh, some source code, and uh, if you have issues like me, then you can try to submit an issue on GitHub. Uh, that's the best way to, to get in contact with us about uh, Merlin. Um, so, that's about it. Thank you, Jacob.